My name is Ruth Machin and I'm a consultant radiologist specialising in thoracic imaging. Today I'm going to talk to you about chest CT. I've split this talk into three parts. Anatomy, a bit about the different types of scan we perform and some common pathologies, specifically pulmonary emboli and pneumonia. So we will start with anatomy. You will hopefully know a lot of this already. The chest is complex, particularly the heart. The heart controls two circuits, pulmonary and systemic. The right heart receives deoxygenated blood from the body via the SVC and IVC into the right atrium and pumps it to the lungs via the right ventricle and pulmonary artery. The left heart receives oxygenated blood from the lungs via the pulmonary veins and left atrium and the left ventricle pumps it around the body through the aorta. The lungs are composed of lobes, three on the right, upper, middle and lower, and two on the left, upper and lower. The upper and lower lobes are divided by the oblique fissure and the middle lobe is separated from the right upper lobe by the horizontal fissure. The lungs are composed of alveoli, the air sacs where gaseous exchange takes place and are supplied by small airways called bronchioles. At a microscopic level, the alveoli are grouped into groups called acini and bound by connective tissue called the interstitium. The pulmonary veins and lymphatics run within this interstitium. On CT we can look at different tissues by altering something called the windows and we will come on to how in a minute. On the left we have a mediastinal window demonstrating a large right hyalur tumour. When you look at a CT remember you view it as if you were looking up from the patient's feet. On the right we have a lung window which highlights air. In this case there is a large tension hydropneumothorax on the left. Look at the heart being pushed into the right side of the chest causing tamponade. So now I'm going to run through some cross-sectional anatomy. Starting in the superior mediastinum we have the aortic arch and on the right the superior vena cava with the trachea posteriorly. Moving down below the level of the aortic arch we can see the ascending aorta anteriorly and descending aorta posteriorly. In between the two is the main pulmonary artery branching into right and left pulmonary arteries. The trachea splits into the right and left main bronchi at the carina. Coming into the heart, we can see the aortic root just above the level of the aortic valve and the right ventricular outflow tract that runs into the pulmonary artery via the pulmonary vein. In the heart, the left atrium is the most posterior cardiac chamber which links to the left ventricle via the mitral valve. The right ventricle is the most anterior chamber and is linked to the right atrium by the tricuspid valve. Below the diaphragm we can see the liver on the right and the spleen on the left with the stomach. As mentioned, the lungs are divided by fissures. The oblique fissure divides the upper and lower lobes from each other. On the right, the horizontal fissure divides the upper lobe from the middle lobe. If we look at a sagittal reconstruction, you can see the upper and middle lobes lie anteriorly in the chest and the lower lobes posteriorly. So moving on to the type of scan. CT was invented by British engineer Sir Godfrey Hounsfield in 1972. Put into simple terms, the patient lies within a rotating gantry. On one side of this gantry is an X-ray source and on the other side a detector. The X-ray beam and detector rotate around the patient to create the scan. When X-rays pass through tissues, they are attenuated. That's to say, some of the X-rays are scattered by the tissue, others are absorbed and some pass through the tissue to the detector. Different tissues attenuate X-rays to varying degrees. X-rays pass through the lungs with very little attenuation, so lots of the rays reach the detector producing a black image. Bone, on the other hand, attenuates lots of the x-rays, so fewer pass through to reach the detector and the image is white. This degree of attenuation of a tissue is given a numerical value. These are called Hounsfield units after Sir Godfrey and they run from the minus thousands to the positive thousands and water lies at zero. The diagram here shows Hounsfield units for various tissues. On 2D images, we can measure the Hounsfield unit in a pixel, and on CT, it's a cube called a voxel. We can then go on and use these numerical values to set our windows to optimise our visualisation of a particular tissue. 
A plain CT is used primarily to look at the lungs. You cannot see the lumen of the cardiac chambers or vessels. And because of this, it can sometimes be difficult to see structures at the hyla, such as lymph nodes. They are great for diagnosing diffuse lung diseases, such as pulmonary fibrosis and for following up lung nodules. Contrast enhanced CT scans of the chest use a dye containing iodine. This lights up vascular structures and organs. Iodine has a high atomic number and it absorbs lots of x-rays so it's really white on CT. We give contrast to enhance soft tissue so it's used to stage lung and pleural tumours. It allows us to accurately measure lymph nodes and diseases such as TB, lymphoma or sarcoidosis. In this example you can see enlarged lymph nodes at the hyla on a coronal reconstruction. On the lung windows there are multiple small nodules. This is pulmonary sarcoidosis. A CT angiogram is a type of contrast scan where the contrast injection is timed to look at the aorta. We do this by giving a bolus of contrast quickly through a large cannula and flushing it through with saline. It's used to look at aortic aneurysms and acute aortic syndrome. Here we can see a dissection flap in the ascending aorta consistent with a Stanford type A dissection. A type A dissection involves the ascending aorta. A type B dissection starts in the descending aorta. A CT coronary angiogram is time to look at the coronary arteries. To prevent image blur, we slow the heart rate down with beta blockers and we scan at end diastole and the cardiac cycle and the heart is relatively still. On this reconstructed image, we can see a subtotal occlusion in the left anterior descending coronary artery. Therefore, as you can probably now work out, a CT pulmonary angiogram is time to look at the pulmonary arteries. There are two main contraindications. The first is a contrast allergy where the patient is allergic to iodine. The other is poor renal function. The patient also needs to be able to hold their breath. And finally, moving on to pathology. I've listed here some common disease processes associated with each of the anatomical areas in the chest, so you can review this in your own time. We're going to discuss the ones in blue briefly. A CTPA is probably the most common type of CT scan we do and one you will we'll be requesting frequently as junior doctors, so we will concentrate on it for a while. Pulmonary emboli typically present with pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath. Patients typically have a raised edema. The Wells score is used to assess the clinical likelihood of a PE. Points are awarded for specific parts of the clinical history and physical signs. We recommend performing a chest x-ray first to look for an alternative diagnosis as a pleural effusion or pneumonia can also cause pleuritic chest pain. If the Wells score is over 4, the NICE guidance suggests progressing straight to CTPA. If the score is 4 or under, we need to measure the D-dimer. If it is normal, we can be reassured that PE is unlikely, and if it's raised, we can move to CTPA. We don't just scan everyone due to the radiation dose. CTPA is an accurate test, but sometimes it can be difficult, and we'll move on to see why. For the scan, the patient needs to lie with their arms above their head. If their arms are by their side, the scan can be affected by artefact. We assess the cannula to make sure it works and practice a breath hold. We get good opacification in the pulmonary artery by a process called bolus tracking. We scan at a single point at the level of the main pulmonary artery and give the contrast. When the intensity of the contrast hits a certain predetermined point, measured in Hounsfield units, the scan triggers. When we come to look at the CTPA, we need to cover the basics, make sure it's the correct patient, check the, correct, uh, check the clinical history. We make sure it's a good scan and we have good opacification of the pulmonary arteries. We look for motion artefacts if the patient hasn't held their breath. We then need to decide if there's a PE and look for features of raised right heart pressures that could suggest hemodynamic instability, as this will help our clinical colleagues manage the patient. We use a mediastinal window to look at the mediastinal structures. We alter the window slightly to make the vessels less bright to assess the pulmonary arteries. And finally, we look at the lungs. In this case, you can see peripheral opacity in both lungs. This is the typical appearance of COVID-19 pneumonia. If the patient is breathed, we can see the motion in the lungs and diaphragm. 
Where there is motion artifact, it can be really difficult to assess the small vessels and the scan can be equivocal rather than giving a definitive yes or no answer as to whether a PE is present. We also need to make sure the contrast is in all of the pulmonary arteries. If we scan too late and it's gone from the right heart into the left heart, we don't get good opacification of all the tiny subsegmental vessels. So on to a couple of cases. This was a 79 year old lady admitted with pleuritic chest pain and tachycardia. She had a well score of five. This was her chest x-ray compared to the most recent previous study from May 2019. She has a pacemaker with right atrial and ventricular leads. On the current study, she had a new peripheral opacity in the right lower lobe, and this is called a Hampton hump. This is a dome-shaped pleural-based opacity in the lung, most commonly due to a pulmonary embolism and lung infarct. An infarct is an area of dead tissue caused by a failure of blood supply. On the CTPA, we can see grey filling defects in the white pulmonary arteries consistent with pulmonary emboli. The associated infarct is seen as a white area peripherally in the middle lobe, and this corresponds to the Hampton hump seen on chest X-ray. It's important to remember that pulmonary emboli can turn up unexpectedly on contrast CT scans that haven't been performed as a CTPA. PE is, for example, common in oncology patients. This example is of a CT to look for a source of infection in an, in an intravenous drug user. There is a PE and pulmonary infarct in the left upper lobe. This can sometimes be seen when the patient has an infected DVT caused by injecting into the femoral vein in the groin. Where a PE is seen in the main pulmonary artery crossing the bifurcation into the right and left pulmonary arteries, it's called a saddle embolus. Patients with a large central clot are more likely to be unwell and hemodynamically unstable with a tachycardia and hypotension. We can assess for hemodynamic instability for looking for features of raised right heart pressures. In this sick patient, we can see the right heart chambers are enlarged compared to the left and the interventricular septum is bowed into the left ventricle. In addition, as the right chamber enlargement has widened the tricuspid valve, there is tricuspid regurgitation and contrast can be seen refluxing down the IVC and into the hepatic veins. Moving on to infection. When we think of a pneumonia on a chest x-ray or CT, we think of what's called consolidation. And this is also known as airspace opacification. However, all this essentially means is that there is stuff in the alveoli making them look white on imaging. This stuff can be pus and inflammatory material in infection, fluid in pulmonary edema and blood in pulmonary haemorrhage. Here's a case of pneumonia in the left lower lobe, but there are also some changes on the right. Material in the alveoli displaces the air, making the lung look white on the CT. Here is a case of pulmonary edema. Changes are symmetrical and central, which is the classical distribution, and there are also bilateral pleural effusions. This is a case of aspiration pneumonia, and note the distended fluid-filled stomach. Moving on to diseases of the interstitium. This is an example of pulmonary fibrosis. Thickening of the interstitium of the lung produces a lacy appearance called reticulation. It leads to shortness of breath as the lungs lose elasticity as they become progressively scarred. Finally, bronchiectasis is an example of an airways disease. It's characterized by dilatation of the airway so it's larger than its accompanying artery. Thickening of the bronchial wall alone does not mean there's bronchiectasis, the airway has to dilate. It's called the signet ring sign as the circle of the dilated airway looks like a ring and the smaller white artery, the stone. So to conclude, in this talk, we've reviewed the relevant anatomy in the chest, looked at the different types of scan we can perform and a few common pathologies. When radiologists protocol your scan request, we tailor the type of CT to answer the clinical question. So it's important to give us as much clinical information as you can. For example, so we can time the contrast injection so the contrast is in the right place. We focused on CTPAs as they are something you will request frequently when you qualify and now you know how to assess them and spot the emboli as filling defects in the opacified pulmonary vessels.